Well, this is a lady. I don't know if some of you all knew, I lived here from 1999 to 2001. Um, some people didn't know that. That's, they find out what I'm giving them a drop home. How are you driving? I can do everywhere. <laughs> uh, when I met Malika, we are both passionate about people. We're talking and it's always sentient and it's always about the human condition. So I say, but this is a woman of like mind, you know? She's not harsh on society. She's more compassionate. Then we realized our love for the arts. And, and, and because she shared her poetic poet with me, I put, it, put her on a show I did called Stronger Than Pride. It was a male pageant, first ever done in Antigua in 2000. And she sat on a stool with a black dress and a, a, a Erica Baduest head tie in yellow, red, and green, and pouted brilliantly, poor openingly. And I said, this is my friend. <laughs> and she good and she closed. But my later story started off, I have to just do the introduction. She's always an academic. I think before identifying what academia is, she was, because she was always interested in books and always interested in information and education actually suited her. A lot of us will say, wow, we was looking for a spare day to go home. You like the system? So that is where her story starts. She has a story that has some similarity because she was a senator as well and had her challenges about whether she was accepting and so But I let her tell her story. You know, I want to, there was a point I wanted to ask her to, to start. Can't we get the point? I have the point there, you know, but it'll come back. Yeah. When she realized that she is interested in the youth, she's interested in the underdog, she's interested became from, because she came from a poor ghetto family, not only touting their struggles, but touting their successes, because many of the people from her community were achievers. So that is how she, she imparted that to her poetry. So from that, let her now start to course the story of how it moved to a lot of, what is the word? There was a militancy in this Malika Parker. And I only shared with her recently, both my parents were trade unionists. And trade, union, trade unionism runs in her blood. So Malika Parker. Thank you, Richard. And good night, everyone. I am the product of a teacher and a nurse, a mother who did not complete primary school, and a father who was very strong in academia. But what they had in common was that they were community organizers. They were advocates, that they cared about the people who lived around them. And so I credit my own outlook on the world to my parents because I grew up seeing them organize and, and advocate for people that were less fortunate than them and sometimes they're in the same boat, but if you need someone to raise the flag, they would raise the flag. That was my environment growing up in Green Bay Grace Farm. The first poem I ever wrote was a poem about my community. I loved my community. I loved it because we were the only dogs. <laughs> I loved it because around me, I saw people who were struggling, but in this struggle, they were so strong and powerful and, and unrepentive and just comfortable in their own skin that that motivated me as a child. And so I drew my strength from my community. Incidentally, Aziza and I are from the same community, okay? Uh, uh, so I, I just loved everything about where I was from. And I love the fact that politically, we dared to be independent. So unlike Aziza, I was very politically activated from a young age. <laughs> I knew my color, and, you know, I knew how to defend it. Okay, so 
I took joy in that and I took pride in that. And the poem that I wrote was an ode to my community and talking about all the powerful people of influence and prominence that had come from the ghetto. What back then we used to term the mud, okay? Uh, so I had advocacy running through my veins. When I started working at the bank, it was not organized, it was not unionized, and there I saw uh, social injustice and industrial issues that needed to be addressed. And so I organized <laughs> so my workers, <laughs> my, my colleagues, and my, my co-workers. Uh, listen, the managers were like, you know, they probably dreaded the day they hired this girl. But I was a good worker. I was a strong worker. But I, I understood the balance of power and the fact that people needed to be a collective and to unite to get things done. And I was very fortunate that persons in the bank in arena who were older than me, they were my seniors, they were there for many years, that they showed confidence in me and they allowed me to lead them. So I took it seriously. Eventually, I ended up on the executive of the union because I was asked to serve. And it is from there, from my work on the union as a trade unionist that I was asked to serve in the Senate. Unlike Aziza, <laughs> unlike Aziza, although it was the party that my parents supported, I actually said no. <laughs> I didn't want to be a senator. I, I understood, I did political science at state college level, and I, I mean, I understood politics and the legislature, but I knew that I was a militant and I was independent of thought and I wasn't too sure that I wanted to put on that straight jacket of collective responsibility and so on, according to how we play politics in this country. Uh, so this process went on for months. It was not as <laughs> smooth as Aziza's, you know, um, unfolding and homecoming. I was back and forth with the Prime Minister. It was a gentleman that I had known from my community work. We were from the same community. And incidentally, he served in the union uh, where I was, a union which, by the way, I eventually became the first female president of. Uh, so I knew him, and he knew me, and he knew my family, and he, you know, my mother would have campaigned for him, and the history was there. But I still felt that I needed to associate with the people and to, to have my independence to, to advocate and to push back and to, to be a part of the resistance. I like being a part of the resistance. Um, and so I didn't immediately accept it. It was a lot of conversation with my family. Of course, my mom and my dad felt that it is something that I ought to do. They had worked and toiled for many years in the political vineyards. And uh, I remember a conversation I had with my father because he tried to convince me by appealing to my sense of duty and, and collectivism. And, you know, his lecture was along the lines that it's service, and if I wanted to serve people, it's an opportunity to serve at a higher level. And, you know, he spoke about all the good things I can do, and I could change this, and I could change. Listen, I usually feel like a superwoman, but when my dad was finished, okay, I really felt invincible, like, yes, I can go and make a, a difference. And so I accepted the prime minister's request uh, for me to serve. And that is how I ended up in the Parliament of Antigua and Barbuda. What I can say is that the journey which, which led me there, um, it's not a path that I chose, similar to, to Aziza, but there were some things that I was sure of from the beginning. I was sure that I wanted to to serve. I mean, I don't want to say serve because sometimes it just seems so structured, that, that, that word, uh, because I didn't identify any particular forum. You know, I, I liked 
being a community organizer, I liked uh, doing social commentary to m through my poetry because I performed uh, my poems a lot. And I initially wanted to be a lawyer, but I always used to joke that I would be a broke lawyer because <laughs> mm -hmm. I would be a lawyer that was into advocacy in terms of changing the system and, and trying to, 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 to gain greater access for people that could not afford it. I grew up in a community where I saw a lot of injustice. I understood people who didn't have a voice. I understood, you know, the dichotomy of power and, and the oppressed. And I felt that I needed to be a part of the resistance. And so even when I, I thought about a professional life, it was always what can I do that will help somebody to, to have that voice. So service was always a part of something that I wanted to do. I, uh, and a platform was provided by my service. I think that if I was not involved in the bank, in organizing, uh, eventually being asked to serve on the executive of the union, uh, that perhaps I would not have gain the notice, you know, of, of the leadership of the country. Uh, but I did, because wherever I am, uh, you know, I, I'm not a shy person for people who know me. I, you know. uh, yes, I'm not shy. I, and perhaps uh, it, it can be a disadvantage at times, but I think that it has served me well, that I am pretty self-assured, like I understand my place in the universe and I'm not ashamed of it, all of it, you know, even, even some of the faults that, that I may have. I appreciate my evolution and I have evolved, okay? And so at the time when I met Richard, uh, when I was working in the bank and I still did some of my activism work in the background, that was not at the forefront. What was at the forefront at that point in my life was the cultural side of me where I loved performing and theater and the arts, and I guess in the end, the two things are really lining up here tonight, <laughs> right? Uh, but one of the things I, I wanted us to take away, especially for the Queens, is that, you know, we, we can be so many things in one package. Sometimes people try to paint us into a particular corner or into a particular caricature, like this is who you are, this is what we expect from you, and you can be only that. And that is not who we are. We are colorful people. I know especially in the Caribbean and especially as women, we are many things, and I am many things. Like I am the girl who is writing the poetry. I am the girl who can go into a forum, you know, at the UN, which I've been fortunate enough to, to be able to do and rub shoulders with the best in the world. You know, I've met the Hillary Clintons with this, that, and the other. I can put on the high heels, but I am also the girl, you know, that can brock it down, okay? <laughs> on Monday and Tuesday, you know, and carnival is my favorite time of the year. And there are people I would look at you like, what is she doing? Why is she doing that? <laughs> you know, uh, because they expect a certain um, thing from you. And especially as young people, one of the things I shared with Richard is that I always get weird looks when I walked into the room. As a trade unionist, I was fortunate enough to be the president of the youth arm of, the, of a global union. This is a global union for the world. And I was elected to represent the USA, Caribbean, Latin America before I was in the Senate. And I remember that I would go to these conferences in South America. First of all, I'm black. First of all, I'm female. Secondly, I'm young, even though it's a youth forum, but at that time I was in my early 20s. You know, youth stretches all the way to 35, so I was generally amongst the youngest in the room. And fourthly, I had the weirdest name ever, okay? My People, God. my Laker. So, People were always stumbling over my name, and it was always out of place. 
and and I never felt out of place. Like I always felt like I belonged. Okay, <laughs> and I was equal. All right. Oh yes. And I said, uh huh. And I really like when they feeling like, okay, she, she yeah, <laughs> and um, she should not be here because I take pleasure in asserting myself and breaking down the barriers. And you know, I I I liked it because they underestimate us at times, and sometimes that can be, you know, our greatest weapon. And so I would say my journey has been fraught with resilience, but resistance as well. Uh, I want us as young women to welcome both. The resistance helps to create a person and to uncover something that you did not even know was there. And that has been my experience. Even in my confidence and my self-assuredness, there has been moments of doubt and query, and second-guessing yourself, and um, especially in periods of trial. I did also share with Richard uh, that I obviously uh, fell out with my party, eventually, with my political organization that I loved, and which my parents had served so well. And it, it came about, for those of us who were paying attention, uh, because of a particular legislation that my government was advancing, the CIP legislation, Citizenship by Investment, uh, that I felt particularly strong about. Not only the content of the bill, but what it meant for my country. I could be wrong, and perhaps I would be proven to be wrong, but it was enough that I felt a level of conviction. And it was not simply based on emotion, because if you know me as well, that little academia thing that he talk about, I love, I do my research, I read, I love to be in the know. And when I don't know, I find people who know, okay? And, and try to, by osmosis or some other measure, you know, get the information they have. And I felt especially convicted about this. And I felt that it was also time for some resilience and some resistance to be there in the political arena that the legislature in parliament, the Senate, the Senate needed to assert itself in our democracy, that our democracy needs challenge <laughs> from within and from without, you know, of these political organizations. And, and I took a stand, and my party was not happy with it. And eventually, you know, the things unraveled. But at no time, at no time did I feel that my decision was not the right one, because I felt like I made it for the right reason, and I was okay with the consequences. Uh, that is not to say that I was right, because I could be wrong. Um, and so here we are today that Richard is meeting me now that I am in a new phase of my life once again uh, with the start of a new political party, which is now, uh, you know, an alternative party in Antigua and Barbuda. Again, it is a path that has not really been, been tread or trod in any meaningful way. But again, I am convicted about it. I believe that it is time. I believe that our country will be benefited by it, whatever the results are, that we need a real choice. And when I say a cho real choice, I don't mean that my party has to be the real choice or the only choice, but that we need choice. <laughs> Just generally, <laughs> options. That is where we find strength, and that is where democracy can really boast that it is representative of the people. And I think as well, we need a space to listen to each other and to not be so locked into our tribal you know, position. 
I understand the tribalism because I was once there, okay? Uh, we, you red, me blue, this, that, and the other. But I think it is also time that it should not be our identity, that that is not only who we are. The, the, you know, what I said before in terms of how you identify yourself, that you can support a particular organization, but not support everything that that organization does. That you can support that particular organization, but question them and hold your organization accountable, all right? That we use the education that we are given, all right, to progress and advance um, wherever you are in, 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 that, in that arena. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have enjoyed all of my journey yeah, as a young right. Antiguan and bad One of your lines you said you don't want to have regrets. You don't hold, you don't look at life with regrets and everything has its purpose and everything um, happens for the development of something else that is positive. Yeah. You shared with me. Right. And it sounds cliche, but once you're, you're making decisions that are based on real sentiments, because we have other things that motivate us, you know, right? We make decisions from a place of um, vendetta and vindictiveness. We can be motivated by jealousy. We can be motivated by greed, all right? So you have to find within yourself that center so that you know your decisions are informed by something greater than those things, that you are informed, you know, by a real spirit of giving whatever your center is, whatever you have used to, you know, c characterize and define yourself. Maybe you're a person who loves deep, more deeper than I do. I know that I identify myself, you know, as an activist and as a change agent and as a truth seeker. It doesn't mean that my truth is the only truth, but I know that when I advance in whatever area, that that is my agenda. And whilst I am motivated by that, I am okay with the repercussions, whatever they are. When people say to you, you have to be able to live with yourself, it's a, it's, it's, it's a real serious statement that requires unpacking. When people say you have to be able to live with yourself and live with your decisions, you have to be comfortable that you're making those decisions from a place that speaks to your soul and that your soul can be renewed by it. So I have made mistakes. doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes, um, but certainly, as I shared with Richard, I seldom have regrets. I seldom have regrets. And at the moment when you're going through that struggle and that tug of war, everything is not revealing itself to you. So we also need patience. <laughs> and we need to trust ourselves and trust the decisions that we have made, that they will unfold for good. Uh, and, and I'm happy and comfortable and hopeful that at the end of my journey, that that would be my story. Thank you. <laughs> so let's hear it for the hopeful optimist who is always full of conviction and uh, chat and doesn't feel um, unwarranted to challenge. One of the things that I started singing while she was singing, uh, while she was talking to me, I started singing an old song, Young, Gifted, and Black. And that was... It came up because every time she taught, told me of what she said, she was always blocked by the corridors of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. She, it is because, who is this young girl? Who is this black young girl? You know? So the, the gender, the age, and the color of skin sometimes serves as an infringement, and she did not let that happen. Let's hear it from Malika Parker. Thank you. So speaker two has not come, and the speaker, yes.